Something I find funny is how so many of these recent movies hide behind a false facade of inclusion, but show open contempt for people who call them out for it. If you don't like our diverse movie, then you're an evil racist. Really? Miles is a black Puerto Rican. Bro is a Reese's peanut butter cup and most people love him, so get out of here with your division tactics and accept that you made a terrible remake. So, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, or just Spider-Verse 2 because I ain't saying all that again, opens with Gwen from the previous film, doing her thing as Spider-Woman, when another interdimensional portal opens up and she fights the Vulture before being helped and recruited into the Spider Society, a group of Spider-Men who return people to their own universes. Afterwards, we catch up with Miles, who's also living it up, but this time as Spider-Man, after his literal leap of faith ending. He's trying to get into college while his crime fighting gets in the way of things, with the most recent villain called The Spot, whose abilities are dimensional holes, a la Looney Tunes. After reconnecting with Gwen, they chase The Spot, they fail, and are brought eventually to the Spider Society, where Miles meets friends old and new, and ultimately, Spider-Man 2099, Miguel O'Hara. But things are not as they seem, and after learning about the Society's rules, goals, and how to achieve them, Miles must decide whether to bend the knee or forge his own path. First things first, the art style is top-notch. It's refreshing to see a film, even a sequel, that tries something different and makes a name for itself with confidence. Sure as hell can't say that about anything Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks have put out over the last almost 20 years. The color is laid on so thick here, it might as well be the applause sign to the audience telling us what to feel, like when Gwen is having a talk with her dad, with the background literally melting away from warm colors to cold. There's also different art styles for different characters, like Hobie, who's a punk rocker Spider-Man from England, drawn like he's a combination of every Sex Pistols album cover ever. So when he, or the aforementioned Vulture, who is also in a similar style, are on screen, they stand out like Lizzo in Ethiopia. Now this does lean into a little gripe that I have about it, which is really just a me thing, since there's so much real artistry on screen, and I'm glad that I get to see it, and I commend the teams that put this gargantuan task to film. But the one gripe I would point out is that there is so much going on at any one time on screen that trying to keep up with things is like asking your cataracts afflicted grandparent to cast professional League of Legends. There is so much effort and passion on screen, you almost can't fully appreciate it in motion, because there is so much more that you know you're missing. So, brace yourself for the inevitable tidal wave of top 100 things you missed in Spider-Verse 2 to flood YouTube. The comedy is pretty on point as well. This is a Spider-Man movie after all, and if it didn't have more quips than The Princess Bride, I'd be a bit disappointed. The chai tea joke probably had me chuckling the most. Not to mention the others that the trailer kind of ruined. Then there are so many references in this film, it's like going to your first convention. Take a movie like Dune, showing and explaining what is needed within a reasonable time. The 914, a touch than worms, the pithing needle, etc., all of which serve purpose for both being references to the book and serving the story. Spider-Verse 2, on the other hand, throws as many references at you as the Mario movie. Like, there's there's literally a Spider-Saurus Rex that comes swinging in out of nowhere that made me audibly ask in the theater, what the fuck? And none of the, none of the references really serve a purpose in the film. Not not that they need to, necessarily, but as someone who is generally knowledgeable of comics, it all becomes noise in the background, which does a disservice to all the effort put into the film. Thankfully, however, the animation and art isn't the only thing this film manages to do mostly right. This is a sequel, after all, and if the characters didn't have some sort of growth, I think I'd have a stroke. Now, there is a bit of a caveat there, which we'll get to later, but for the most part, the characters just kind of exist as alternate versions of Peter Parker, so while they are neat to see, you don't get much in the way of development with them. The exceptions being, of course, Miles and Gwen. As I mentioned before, Gwen has a few talks with her dad, and the pain of not having the confidence to talk to your dad is something that many of us can relate to. Miles goes through something similar. While Gwen seeks closure, Miles grows in confidence as himself, having already done so as Spider-Man in the previous film. I can't say that about Peter B. Parker, though. Just like every rip averse detractor, he continues to be an absolute joke. In the previous film, he was a loser, whose spark was reignited by his pupil, and he's got his confidence back. But now he walks around in fuzzy slippers and an open bathrobe. All the while, he's taking care of his newborn baby. Now normally, I wouldn't care so much about that, but in order to explain my reasoning more thoroughly, I do have to get into a little bit of spoiler territory here. So if you're good with it as it is, 
check out now. If not, this is your one warning. So the main gimmick of the film is non-canon events. The way that Spider-Man 2099 explains it all is that Spider-Men have a series of events that must occur in their lives that cannot be altered, like the death of an uncle or a police captain. Should these events be changed, then it will spark the collapse of that universe. That is fucking retarded. It was at this point I actually almost checked out of the movie, because consistency has been dropped off the ledge like Baby Goku. A non-canon event. So the whole first film would have imploded in on itself like you divided by zero? So Specimen 42 being brought to Miles' universe fits that criteria, does it not? So five to ten minutes after he was bit, that whole universe should have just collapsed, right? Or how about that the spider was brought there in the first place? How about Gwen, or Peter Beta Parker, or any of the other Spider-Man being brought to Miles' universe? Spider-Man India's universe literally starts collapsing in that same time frame right after his captain is saved, but we're supposed to ignore those rules being broken before they were even written? Peter Bitch Parker wouldn't have had a family if it wasn't for Miles being brought to his universe, so doesn't that mean that May Day is just as much of an anomaly as Miles? And hold on, doesn't that mean the entire Spider Society is non-canon as well? They shouldn't be there unless Miguel traveled to their universe to recruit them, from which in itself is a non-canon event. There's so many plot holes. Nurse! And if you think that's bad, guess what was directly referenced in this film? Spider-Man No Way Home! Miguel knows about Tom Holland's timey-wimey fuckery, which connects this to the MCU. And what did the MCU establish way back in Doctor Strange 2? That's right, the threat of the convergence, which means that the presence of foreign people to another's universe threatens to destroy it. So how the fuck can there be a spider society? There are at least a thousand Spider-Men there, which should increase the chance of a convergence by like a thousand fold. But yeah, let's ignore that shit like Biden's illicit dealings. And understand, I'm not naive to the writers not having knowledge of the other's film during pre-production, which is not their fault, but not working together or at least keeping each other in the loop has created two completely broken and now connected rule sets. And I mean broken. Broken like a PS2 jumped to its death off of a stool. But wait, the problems don't end there. Let's touch back on Miguel for a moment, right? Miguel created the Spider Society to help ensure the collapse of a universe never happened again. And how does one do this? The Society's mission is to ensure that the canon events of Spider-Men occur. As stated before, events like the death of a close relative or a police captain, this has to happen. This is the antithesis of Spider-Man's character, let alone almost every superhero ever. Just let people die. Really? Miguel's reasoning and actions make absolutely no sense. If the idea is to prevent things from happening out of continuity, then inaction is what he should have committed to, not creating the Spider Society. Sending all these Spider-Men out to capture and return anyone they catch back to their own universe inherently is non-canon and thus risks collapsing that universe. So Miguel is risking universes to save universes and not a single member of the society thought, nah fam, that's a pretty stupid idea. Not one. Let's round back to the point I made earlier about the characters. Gwen watching an inexperienced Spider-Man grow up to match them in skill and confidence and thus learns herself that the odds can be defined now just accepts that she has to stand by and watch people die or suffer in horrible ways? Are we- are we serious? Peter Bottom Parker, who taught Miles to take a leap of faith, is now delegated to a level above stay-at-home parent who is now dumb enough to bring his daughter into battle. And then he signs up for this shit? Miguel has knowledge across the Spider-Verse. He didn't look down at that baby and say, yeah, that thing's an anomaly, get out. Like, really? He was made into a kind of pansy for the second film in a row. Gwen basically becomes subservient out of fear, not neglecting her learned individuality towards the end of the film, and all of this just so the film can hold up Miles higher on a pedestal? This isn't growing characters, this is retarding them to elevate the main character who has done literally nothing wrong. They receive similar character retcons as Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z to Super. The writers threw out life-changing lessons, consistency, and reason just so they could write their shit story. And yet, 
After all of these problems are pointed out and the flaws stemming from them, I bet the writers are just going to sweep it all under the rug as these events were canon from the beginning. You know, because there are no real problems in Ba Sing Se. And you can mark my words, because people will ask the same questions or point out the same flaws, if they haven't already, and come to the same conclusions. At the end of the day, Across the Spider-Verse is in the same category, but not as good as No Way Home. It's just middling. As I said before, I really enjoyed the film. It's fun, well animated, the comedy is on point, and some of the character moments, like Gwen with her dad are really strong. But the monumental flaws can't be ignored, and I'm not going to go along with the hype and lie to you that this is some flawed masterpiece. If the foundational rules are broken, then the faulty story can't hold up the weight of these degraded characters no matter how good the paint job is. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.